lives we all have pain we all have sorrow but if we are wise we know that there's always tomorrow leave me lonely when you're not strong and i'll be your friend i'll help you I'm gonna need somebody to lean on And please swallow your pride If I have things you need to borrow For no one can fill those of your needs That you and let show lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on you just call on me brother when you need a hand we all need somebody to lean on I just might have problem that you'd understand we all need somebody to lean on and if there is a load you have to bear that you can carry and right up the road I'll share strong and I'll be your friend I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on just call on me brother when you need a hand we all need somebody to lean on I just might have a problem that you'd understand. We all need somebody to lean on. And lean on me when you're not strong. And I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. For it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean. Welcome to First Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Ann Arbor. I'm Dr. Glenn Thomas Rideout, Director of Worship and Music. And the worship team and I welcome you and welcome you back. If this is your first time among us, a particular welcome to you. If you're coming back again, welcome back. No matter how long you've been with this community, your presence makes a difference. And your being here makes our community richer, challenges us to aspire to greater love, made more alive each moment we live. Your presence, your giving, your singing, you're lighting a chalice wherever you are. All that you do to engage in these moments makes a difference. Together, across the span of distance and time, we form community. And we make a difference in the world. As we move more deeply into today's service, I invite you to take just a nice, relaxed breath with me. Today you'll have a chance to sing, to listen, 
to sit in silence, to give, to ponder. And we'll do all of that together. We may be apart physically, but we're still co-creating what happens in this space. We'll be looking at ways that might help us cope with this complex, confusing time. Afterwards, I hope you'll join us for Social Hour on Zoom. It was quite fun last week. Our fabulous WebTech volunteers have set up an easy-to-remember link. You just have to go to uuaa.org slash social hour, and it'll direct you where you need to go. Also, going forward, you'll be able to find the services at uuaa.org slash service. Welcome to this time together. On this day, named like many days before it, and yet unlike any other day, let there be a light to see and be seen, a light to remember justice in all its forms. On this week, which holds the Trans Day of Visibility, let us remember our part in seeing the fullness of each member of creation. And on this day, in this week, let there be a light to remember our ancestors, our forebears, which bring us to the present day. Let us remember our part in the ancestry of future generations. In that line of time, we acknowledge and give thanks for all the lives that have gone before. 
we acknowledge and we mourn the loss of those who have recently died within our community and beyond. I name ones among us who most recently have become our newest ancestors. Epi Potts. Stan Tischler. Bev Todd. On this day, on this present day, let us be a gift to tomorrow by knowing our purpose and by learning love more deeply with and among each other. The chalice cup with the flame, the symbol of Unitarian Universalists and Unitarian Universalism all around the globe and across the span of time, we light today to remind ourselves, to remind ourselves of what we mean to the earth and what we aspire to follow as the guides to our path of living. If you have a candle, if you have a chalice, I welcome you to join me. Let's light the flame across our community's span, across distance and time. Together, let us say, we light this chalice for the light of truth. We light this chalice for the warmth of love. We light this chalice for the energy of action. We light this chalice for the harmony of peace. We come together not held by a common doctrine or dogma, not held together because we believe the same, but because we endeavor to love each other and the earth with the fullness of our being. And we believe community done well can help in that work. So we promise each other a covenant. We renew it each week to guide our path. Let us say the covenant again. Together, let us say, the spirit of this church is love and service is its law. This is our covenant with each other to dwell together in peace, to search for truth in love and to help one another. This morning, we are exploring all the different feelings that we might be having as we deal with this time of so much uncertainty and change. And so I wanna share a story about a little boy who deals with some hard feelings of his own and the ways that his friends try to help him. It's called The Rabbit Listened. One day, Taylor decided to make something. Something new, something special, something amazing. Taylor was so proud. But then, out of nowhere, things came crashing down. The chicken was the first to notice. 
Cluck, cluck. What a shame. I'm so sorry, sorry, sorry this happened. Let's talk, talk, talk about it. Cluck, cluck. But Taylor didn't feel like talking. So the chicken left. Next came the bear. Arr, arr, how horrible. I bet you feel so angry. Let's shout about it. Grr, rawr. But Taylor didn't feel like shouting. So the bear left. The elephant knew just what to do. Trumpeta, I can fix this. We just need to remember exactly the way things were. But Taylor didn't feel like remembering. So the elephant also left. One by one they came. The hyena. <laughs> Let's laugh about it. The ostrich. <laughs> Let's hide and pretend nothing happened. The kangaroo. Tss, tss, what a mess. Let's throw it all away. And the snake. Shh. Let's go knock down someone else's. But Taylor didn't feel like doing anything with anybody. So eventually they all left until Taylor was alone. In the quiet, Taylor didn't even notice the rabbit, but it moved closer and closer until Taylor could feel its warm body. Together they sat in silence until Taylor said, please stay with me. The rabbit listened. The rabbit listened as Taylor talked. The rabbit listened as Taylor shouted. The rabbit listened as Taylor remembered and laughed. The rabbit listened to Taylor's plans to hide, to throw everything away, to ruin things for someone else. Through it all, the rabbit never left. And when the time was right, the rabbit listened to Taylor's plan to build again. I can't wait, Taylor said. It's going to be amazing. The end. Mazes inherently are frustrating. They are made of multiple branching paths with more than one way to get in and to get out. And paths lead to dead ends. There are obstacles. And you can get lost in a maze. Sometimes it feels like you might never escape. A labyrinth has only one non-branching path that leads to a center and back. Now, the paths may be quite elaborate, but you cannot get lost. Labyrinths are ancient. They've been around for thousands of years. In the Middle Ages, labyrinths were connected to Christian contexts, and they were um, a, a way for people to practice spiritual centering and contemplation and prayer. Now, right now, in the midst of this pandemic, it might feel like we are in a chaotic and overwhelming maze. It seems like everything around us, everything inside of us is changing rapidly, day to day, maybe even hour to hour. We feel like we are up against obstacles and dead ends. We're frozen in time, both confined and isolated, and yet, the world feels like it is moving rapidly. It is tumbling ahead into a future that we can't even imagine. But what if we reimagine the complexity as a labyrinth? Come with me as we circle inward. In our slowing down, we begin to recognize the stillness within us. As we circle inward, our thoughts become quieter. And in our slowing down, we can more easily focus on that which is holy. The universe, the human mind, the natural world, God, 
love. I invite you to settle in more deeply now. Find a space that is comfortable for you. Maybe take a few more breaths as we move, move deeper into our worship through this meditation. And I invite you to participate by watching or by tracing your own path or just by being in this time of silence together. May we remember there is a way to the center of our being. May we not lose the stillness that has come to us along the way. May that stillness bring us comfort today and always. Amen. This past week, I had the opportunity to return to our congregation's building briefly to get some materials that I needed to keep working at home. As I walked through the building, I found myself feeling such deep sadness. I saw an empty sanctuary waiting to be filled with our congregation gathering together for worship. I saw an empty social hall waiting to be filled with coffee and conversation. I saw empty meeting rooms waiting for groups to gather again. 
and empty classrooms waiting to be filled with the joyous sounds of children and teenagers. I looked at all of this and I just wanted to weep. But then I remembered that these are just outward forms of our congregation. The true soul of our community has carried on even stronger and more creative than ever in these past few weeks. I see it in our online classes for kids and teens where they play games with one another from their living rooms. I see it in online gatherings for our chalice circles, our chalice singers, our board members, our vision team, and so many more. I see it in our closed Facebook group where day after day, hundreds of you gather to offer one another encouragement, support, and the gift of laughter. I see it in the hundreds of hours that our dedicated volunteers and staff members have put into transitioning us into this new way of being together. And I see it in our newfound ability to connect with other spiritual seekers and Unitarian Universalists around the world who otherwise wouldn't be able to join us for worship, but now can online. All of this has been possible because we keep showing up for one another. We keep offering each other the gift of our presence, our time, our energy, and our financial contributions. There's so much that's uncertain right now, but one thing is certain, and that's our love for and commitment to one another. May we be held by that love this week and in all the weeks to come. Thank you for your generosity.
We're living in a strange moment in human history. It's unprecedented, it's paradoxical, and it's intense. The world around us is changing daily, sometimes hourly, with everything from new theories about how the virus spreads to reports on how state governments are or are not taking care of their people. Many organizations have moved to online everything, with the steep learning curve and urgent deadlines that go with that. At the same time as this whirlwind rages, most of us are also stuck in a relentless sameness. We can only leave our houses for the most critical tasks. If we have any symptoms at all, we can't even go outside for a walk. Living rooms have transformed into office, and classroom, and play area, and cafeteria, and maybe look like that flock of birds from the story also made their way through. Those deemed essential workers, and those losing their jobs, face a different but still relentless sameness, worrying about the well-being of themselves and their loved ones. Whirlwind and stasis happening simultaneously. Is it any wonder that folks might be feeling unsettled? Our usual ways of dealing with uncertainty and fear and grief tend to be embodied practices. Getting together with a friend for coffee, meeting with a therapist, going to the gym, organizing a protest, holding a memorial service, gathering in congregations. Our bodies keep telling us that they know what to do when the community is in crisis, but for safety's sake, we're forced to override our own instincts. Bodies are the slowest part of us to change. Our spirits, thoughts, emotions can all sprint like the wind and turn on a dime. But bodies plod along. They take a while to learn new ways of being, and millions of years of evolution won't be set aside in a month. Right now, our options for connecting in meaningful ways are severely limited. We can handwrite letters, as long as we're sure we're not passing along germs. We've got phone calls and emails and social media. And if we're lucky, we can see each other live via disembodied two-dimensional images on a screen. What in the world are we supposed to do with all of this? The complex, the uncertain, the paradoxical, the grief-inducing? How do we hold it all? When I asked myself this question the other day, my first response was, juggle. If we don't have enough hands to hold it all, we juggle and prioritize. And there's some wisdom in that. Maybe you need to put off making dinner for 15 minutes to give yourself some space to cry. Or your kid gets to watch an extra movie so that you can work on something critical for your job. Or you set aside a project to savor your overflowing gratitude for a stranger's kindness. My second response to that question, though, was that instead of juggling, maybe we need to put some stuff down right now. Our culture has trained us to believe that doing and making progress are the same thing. But just as our evolutionary instinct to gather in the face of threat needs to be put on hold, so does this capitalist myth about activity and productivity. Right now, it's the emptiness of our streets that indicates progress. Right now, slowing down enough to recognize what our bodies and our spirits need counts as a success. Right now, cultivating an inner stillness and listening to each other deeply, as the rabbit did with Taylor, those are basic survival skills. And that's the goal right now, to survive 
and to do everything we can to make sure everyone else survives as well. If we keep our focus on what is of ultimate importance, the whirlwind may rage on around us, but we can keep coming back to the still point in the center. Amen. I don't know what your week has been like, but mine has been one of sitting with the losses that our UUAA community is already encountering. We've had several beloved people in our community die this week, not necessarily COVID related, but losses nonetheless. It's been a time also in my personal life in which I've been navigating news, such as one of my spiritual teachers personally wrestling with COVID, a friend of many, many years losing a sibling to COVID, another beloved longtime friend actively in the ICU in another state. These types of uncertainties and and situations would be enough already. And add on top of that the news that I've had to be present to, that each of us in our own way have had to be present to, the information that, you know, a 100,000, 200,000 losses, deaths in our country might be the best case scenario that we are trying to move towards and, and that the situation we're trying to avoid is several million people potentially dying. I hear that type of information and I find inside internally, I just get, I start to get spun up with anxiety and almost panic as I sit with the fear and the worry about, am I gonna be okay on the other side of all of this? Is my spouse, Jeff, gonna be okay on the other side of this? What about our kids? What about those folks who are family or our adopted family to us when we're hearing that more and greater losses are yet to come? I worry and I sit with the fear of, Who might I lose that I don't know about yet today? What are those losses that may still happen? And that, that, my beloveds, my friends, is the is the whirlwind. We saw the image of the whirlwind in the in that children's book of the of the birds swooping in unexpectedly and messing everything up, messing up life for that young child. Reverend Cassie shared with me a a podcast this week, which we will share with the community, with each of you in the days ahead. It's a conversation between Brene Brown and David Kessler, an expert in the field of death and dying and grief, uh, a peer of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And in this conversation, Brene Brown says she's been having lots of conversations in this pandemic era of ours. And And the consistent thing that she's hearing as she's talking to people is this profound sadness, this grief over what we are all collectively and personally going through right now. And and she says that, you know, as she's sensing that, picking up on that very clearly, you know, she subsequently mirrors back and offers to her conversation partner that, you know, I'm hearing a lot of grief in what you're sharing right now. And the person invariably says back almost immediately she she shares, oh, I'm not grieving, everything's okay. To which she kind of thinks to herself, yeah, you know, we're okay 
ish. <laughs> and yet, there's also grief and sadness. David Kessler points out that, you know, grief is not just about the loss of another human being in our lives. It is. It is that, the physical loss of a beloved person or being, an animal, a pet. But it can also be about the loss of ideas, the loss of activities, the loss of routine, the loss of familiarity, the loss of plans that we had been looking forward to in Ann Arbor right now. This is spring break from our public schools. In the face of loss, grief is real. And what we know about grief is what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross helped teach us, that we go through a whole range of experiences related to that. The denial, no, I'm not, I'm not sad, I'm not grieving, even though there is already, there are already things worth grieving. There's already loss and sadness. The externalizing of it, of it the, the, the imposing our own frustration and anger on others, another form of grief, the sense of sadness that expresses itself just as tears as moments of crying on a, on a friend's shoulder or on the phone with somebody we love and care about. The bargaining. Oh, you know, uh, I'll just go out for a short while. I'll, I'll walk around somebody if I see them. I'll make sure the kids don't come in contact with other kids. I'm sure I could just go into the office for a few minutes, even though we have a stay at home order, right? We come up with the bargains around what might be safe and what might not be safe acceptance, accepting those times we're in. Is there any choice but to do that? And what David Kessler adds to all of that, you know, he got permission from the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation to add an additional stage to the stages of grief, making meaning out of the times we're in, not just accepting our circumstances, accepting reality as it is, but we human beings also need to make meaning of the experience we've had. Yes, and there are moments when I am at my most grounded, most centered, most still, wiser inner self, that there are little glimpses of making meaning out of the time that we're in, but it's anything but consistent. <laughs> Many of you who are social scientists or psychologists, you know Abraham Mas Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. And that need to feel fundamentally, very basically safe, secure in our physical, natural environment is among the most basic of human needs. And there are moments where in that fear and uncertainty and panic, I don't know that I'm basically safe. I don't know that I'm basically okay. I hope for all of that. But there are times in the fear and uncertainty that I don't know that I know that for sure. What Maslow reminds us is that things like meaning making and making a sense of purpose out of the time when we were in or the experiences we've had, that comes much later. That is much higher up in the hierarchy of human needs, much more basic before meaning making is are we even okay? Are we even okay? I find in the midst of the, the whirlwind that on a day-to-day -day basis, as I find myself slipping into the fear and uncertainty, I have to notice it and I have to do the things that I know work for me personally. And for each of us, we have the own, our own practices of wisdom, our own practices of grounding that we have to turn to in these times. For me, it looks like coming into this basement that you're joining me in today and jogging in place and bringing to mind all the frustration as I'm in that physical energy, all the frustration and the anger that I'm feeling right now, even rage at wishing that our nation was doing better and supporting human life and human beings right now. The, the frustration at, at, at being in a confined physical space with people I love, but it's a lot of togetherness that's enforced on us right now. And it's frustrating at times, all of that anger and frustration, finding a way to physically release it, exercise, 
going literally from that to times of meditation in which I can still my inner energy, quiet the noise. I do all of that and then I that I do the work of taking care of my body too, trying to eat healthy, trying to turn to salt scrubs, which uh, folks say can be an antioxidant type of thing for your skin, getting rid of uh, energies, physical energies that we want to release that don't serve us. And then for me, it's rinse, wash, repeat, rinse, wash, repeat. I'm doing all of that on a daily basis, needing to physically work with my inner energy, still my physical energy, release whatever I can release. I don't have a choice right now but to be in this maelstrom, in this whirlwind. But even as the whirlwind is imposed on us and doesn't give any sign of leaving us anytime soon, I need to find, each of us in our own way, needs to find moments of stillness and releasing those energies that we can moving individually and collectively towards that deeper ground of being in which our truest hearts, our most loving hearts, our deepest ground of wisdom lies. It's an imperfect task for an imperfect time. And I invite each of you into that ongoing practice with me. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned, circle for release, circle for the planet, Circle for its soul, for the children of our children. Keep the circle whole. Circle round for freedom. Circle round for peace. For all of us imprisoned, circle for release, circle for the planet, circle for its soul, for the children of our children, keep the circle whole. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace. For all of us imprisoned, circle for release, circle for the planet,
beloved, go forth from this day knowing that you are embraced, for now virtually, the loving embrace of this community, all who are gathered here, who are walking with you, with us, with me, side by side during these uncertain times. The mails from the whirlwind will find us, and yet let us together in loving support of one another, in loving support of that, those deepest values that are ours as UUAA, strive to find the moments of stillness, the moments of releasing and letting go of chaotic energies that let us ground ourselves in the best of human possibility, in the best of all that we aspire to be. Go now in peace until we are together once again.